welcome to the Data Leadership Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony J. Algman. Data is everywhere in our businesses, and it takes leadership to make the most of it. We bring you the people, stories, and lessons to help you become a data leader. Today, I'm joined by Robert S. Siner. Bob is the authority on non-invasive data governance, the publisher of TDAN.com and founder of KIK Consulting and Educational Services. He was my very first podcast guest, and I can think of no one better to talk with me about today's topic, online presentations and content creation. Bob, welcome back to the show. I'm very happy to be here. I'll always be there when you're wanting to talk this way. Good. I will hold you to that. Okay. So. <laughs> The reason that I wanted to have you back, and, and obviously we're, we are still in the midst of this coronavirus, COVID-19 lockdown, we're all working remotely, we're all doing uh, all of this work that, you know, sometimes we've been in the office, sometimes we've been remote, but you and I have been fortunate in that we, for a long time, have been able to do a lot of our work remotely, and a lot of what we do uh, manifests out on the internet in some way or another. And so knowing that a lot of people have been working very hard to try to adjust to this new normal for what it is at this intermediate period, um, I thought it would be useful to have you on and we could talk about some of the things that we've learned in doing the kinds of things that we do like webinars or producing a website or creating um, online content. And, and I definitely want to talk more about TDAN especially than we did last time and a lot about what we do with um, those webinars, because I know you've been doing webinars for a very long time, and I'm sure you can help folks with what to do when you're presenting to an audience online and some of the things to watch out for and, and um, think about. So why don't we start with that, and we'll just see where the conversation goes from there. Okay, fantastic. And yeah, I've been doing webinars for a very long time. Uh, since uh, January of 2012, I think, is when I got started doing it, doing it monthly. So that's well over 100 webinars. Um, you know what? It is an adjustment doing webinars, doing presentations online versus doing presentations in front of an audience of people, which we do, we both do quite a bit, mm -hmm. or we did when people were getting together. And I'm hoping that again, at some point we will. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that you know, kind of struck me is that I, I do a lot of my reading of what people are, um, how people are reacting to what I do by looking at them right. and seeing them, whether they're paying attention, they're laughing at my jokes, they're <laughs> looking at their iPhone, they're talking to each other, they're, you know, whatever they're doing, or they're, they're engaged by nodding up and down, or they're shaking their head. Right. Um, to me, that's very important. And it, it, it's tough to get used to doing that because, you know, you're used to saying something remotely funny <laughs> and hoping that somebody's going to laugh or at least chuckle. And if you can't get that response, it's difficult because, you know, as a presenter, as somebody who really likes to get their ideas across, it's it, that that feedback, that that facial expression, the body language is um, is a big part of it. And uh, it's it takes getting used to not having that. Yeah, well, and, and there's there's this progression, too, of, you know, the, the hardest thing, because I'm with you, like, I love to present in front of a classroom of, full of people, and you can feel the energy, like, it, it's not even about just the, the like, nonverbal feedback that you could identify, it's really just there's an energy in a room that you know if something is landing well or, or not, it's it's very... Uh, it's very helpful to have that feedback loop. And and the worst is when you're doing a webinar, because on a webinar, it is just stone silence. <laughs> and so like you and I, we both try to tell our jokes or try to do, you know, things that, um, you know, what people will find entertaining, but we have literally no idea of if, whether the joke lands or not. Sometimes I know the joke isn't landing because it's, it's no longer sensical. Um, but otherwise, <laughs> I really don't know. And so that's the the hardest. But then there's this kind of a whole intermediary where you have things like you're, you're doing a Zoom conference or like what we're doing right now. Like I can see you sort of and I can sort like we, we have some nonverbal communication happening. Um, and that's better than nothing, certainly. Um, and it's probably better than just audio. Um, especially when you're presenting to a room full of people and everybody's muted, it's almost like the webinar situation where there's no feedback whatsoever. And so it's something to think about both from the perspective of the presenter and, and producing the content and trying to, to get the message across. But also, if you're the person leading a team trying to form these meetings, I'm a big advocate of trying, unless there's technical reasons to keep you from doing it, you know, have people on video, even if they're quiet, have them on video so you can see them, see them engaged. 
um, and and you know, understand if people are, are not paying attention or, or what have you. I just feel like FaceTime, um, you know, looking at each other is better than not having that. Has that, has that been your experience with clients as well? Well, you know, one of the interesting things is that, that sometimes there's out, outside noises that start to enter into what, what you're doing. So they, I, I think my neighbor's landscapers always wait until I'm ready to do my <laughs> webinar and then they yeah. show up and they're really loud. Um, but, you know, it's, um, you know, at least in some of the meetings, and in, in, especially in the webinars, there's an ongoing chat. Mm. And the groups that we speak to often, uh, they, um, they have a very engaged community. And so when people were talking, it was always my first reaction. And this was, and I was just getting better at this now, of kind of trying to look and see what's going on in the chat while I'm trying to keep my train of thought and speak to the the subject that I'm, I'm talking about. Um, yeah, it's um, it, it's extremely important that uh, that we see people even in, in business meetings because you can still see whether or not they're paying attention. Um, you'll see if I get distracted during this podcast because <laughs> the chances are that's not going to happen. You never, I'm never distracted um, <laughs> when I'm talking to you. Um, but it really does help. But there's some people that are really not used to it. I mean, I remember when I was in the corporate world and video chat or video conference rooms started to pop up at the company that I was working for. And there was, and at that point it didn't even pan, you know, to the person that was speaking. It was just right. always in one spot or some of them did, <clears throat> excuse me, pan to who was speaking and, or even who was making a noise. And all of a sudden you'd be looking at somebody who's like, you know, doing, doing something that's kind of goofy. Um, I think it is good. I think that's why tools like this, we're using Zoom, are, are very helpful. Uh, Skype and Microsoft Teams, although I haven't started to really utilize those, are becoming more and more in play. Go to Meeting, WebEx, they're all taking advantage of it. And I think when we get out of this pandemic, this stay at home, um, not go into the office work environment, that that's going to, it's not going to go back to exactly the way that it was, mm -hmm. that people will continue to work out of their home offices if they're being productive the way the things that they're doing. So I, uh, I, I think it's very important to, to see who you're talking to um, for the reasons that we mentioned earlier, just so you can kind of get off, work off that energy. I'm not a person that even in my presentations at the, the day diversity events and other events that gets up and w dances around the floor and walks. I typically am seated. Right. Um, you know, I actually sit behind a podium a lot of times because I don't really want to be what they're looking at. I'd rather them look at the content. Yeah. Right. So for me, it, that part of it was easy. I, I sit in one place, but still seeing my facial expression, seeing their facial expression, and it's it's very important. So I think that organizations should be or will be doing more of this moving forward. And as the tools continue to get better, um, it's going to get better. Uh, and as people get used to it, they're going to get better at it, too. Yeah, well, I am one of those people that is constantly wandering throughout the the audience, and you know this well. I will, I'll end up at the back of the room somehow and be like, "How did I get here?" And, and like a lot of times, we have microphones that are hooked up to our like our lapels and stuff, and so they can hear me fine. But I I'm constantly in motion, kind of all the time anyway. But I think the 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 key thing uh, that I want to highlight too is that this is a learned skill. This is a new learned skill. So it's one thing to learn how to present to a room full of people in a conference room or, or at the front of a room. It's a whole nother thing to be able to present online in a way that people can resonate. And sometimes things are recorded, they're presented later, or, you know, the, it's, it's a lot of different mechanisms. But even just communicating with your team on Zoom is a learned skill. And that's something that I think is, is important for us as individuals and important for team leaders and managers to recognize is that we need to be taught some of this stuff sometimes. We need to learn this stuff and realize that this isn't something that we can just natively do, especially right now when many of us are juggling additional responsibilities with children or neighbors making a lot of noise or what have, like there's certain amounts of like, okay, like we understand everybody's kind of in this situation right now, but at the same rate, you want to project as much professionalism as possible because that will help you distinguish yourself amongst your peers. And that's important too. 
Yeah, I, I don't think I heard you use the word opportunity in there, but I think this is a big opportunity for everybody who's watching this podcast. If they want to become a data leader or a manager of people or of teams, um, you're going to find that the count, the data governance, for example, council meetings mm -hmm. are going to be done with people being all over the place. So being on calls, getting used to it and getting skilled at being able to present this way. But it goes even beyond this. And I know this is another subject that you like to talk about, which is how do I put together my materials to maximize the, eff the effectiveness of the communications in these types of meetings? Right. And, you know, some people... Um, say that they're very good at putting together slide presentations. Uh, I, I know that I spend I spend a lot of time paying extra close attention to the font size and mm -hmm. how things are displayed on the screen. So I think it's a time where we uh, as practitioners and everybody who's listening to this, who if they're going to recognize that they're going to be in meetings like this, take a little bit of time. Read books on data storytelling. Read <laughs> books on... Uh, on a whole bunch of subjects, or even just go out and look at presentations that have been successful online and look for, well, what makes them successful versus the ones where the fonts are changing and there's silly pictures that have nothing to do with, although I'm guilty of that a little bit, you know, silly pictures that have nothing to do with the subject that's on the screen. I mean, we can all improve our capabilities. And in the end, in the end game, after we get through this whole mess, um, is that to have those skills, it will differentiate you from the people that don't have those skills. That's right. And it, it is an opportunity. That's the key word, I think, mm -hmm. for people to learn how to get better at this. And it will only, it, it can't damage your career at all. It can only help your career, especially if you are specifically effective at being able to communicate this way. Yeah, well, and this and this lockdown has only accelerated things that were already in progress. Like this didn't start with the the coronavirus. This started a long time ago and has been necessary, especially as our teams have become more decentralized and as we have global footprints and teams that have to work together and and communicate with one another. It's really just an amplification of what has already been happening for a long time. And and I think that that's, you know, good public speaking skills, good organizational skills are, are going to apply in every circumstance. But there are definite nuances that come out with the kind of virtualized world that we find ourselves in that that should be addressed too. And I, and I like that term, you know, opportunity is really what it is uh, for you to stand up and, and, you know, demonstrate that you can do this. And there's, there, there's a lot of things. I mean, heck, even in, in sound check yesterday, we were troubleshooting issues with microphones, you know, and that's something that we right. got right. And now it'll sound okay. better for the actual audience. But if we didn't go through that work to make sure that we had everything put together, then it would have hurt our overall broadcast. And that, to, you know, because we wanted to put the best thing forward, we went through and did that. That's the kind of work that you can do before your meeting or before you're you're out presenting at a webinar or what have you um you know that you can really consider but i want to think about there's a lot of us and, and we can you and i can especially take for granted that people have forums to do this and granted everybody seems to be on zoom doing team meetings and stuff but what if you wanted to break into the world of doing more content creation in a public facing way, whether it's webinars, whether it's writing, whether it's um, you know, producing something that can get your voice heard by more people. How? Let's talk a little bit about what is your advice to folks that are trying to start to get out there and be become recognized as a thought leader in whatever industry they're, they're a part of? I'm going to steal a line from Nike. I'm going to say, just do it. <laughs> that, that is the best way to get started. I can, and I'll speak to in a couple of minutes, the channel, a channel that I can provide to people who want to write, who have never written before and who just want to share their ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, really the idea is to just do it. They, um, with the stay at home work orders, uh, people working from out of their home and things turning into more of a virtual world, I keep very close tabs on the statistics with my, my online publication, tdan.com. If you're not familiar with it, go visit tdan.com. But it, it's, um, and so I know that there has been an impact. At first, my statistics went down, but then my statistics started to go up as people got used to working within their homes. Um, 
and and so that and I, I'm watching it on a daily, hourly, not minute by minute, <laughs> but but an hourly, you know, kind of basis. Certainly at the end of the day, at the beginning of the next day, I see well, what were my statistics? Are they consistent with what they have been? Are they above what they were a year ago? So there is, first of all, there again, I'm going to use the word opportunity again. That's the word of the day, I guess. <laughs> if you flash up something that says the word of the day, opportunity, <laughs> is that there's a lot of organizations and there's a lot of companies that are providing opportunities to you to communicate that way. Mm -hmm. So look for those. I mean, so for example, TDAN, the Data Administration Newsletter, any of you out there who wants to write or is passionate about what you're doing, please consider sending me content. It's a really difficult process to get published. You talk to me, I look at it. If I think it fits well for my readers, I'm gonna publish it, but it's not just me. It's any organization that's out there, even um, some of your software vendors that, are, um, that have uh, blogs on their product or build communities with their products. Um, they're looking for people just like you to come up to them and to write something that they can share with their readers. And you know what? It doesn't have to be perfect. Don't worry if you're not a Pulitzer Prize winner uh, <clears throat> with your writing, mm -hmm. because you know what? It takes time to get your to get being skilled with your written word the same way as it takes time to get skilled with you know doing these types of meetings and and those types of things. So just like I said. Just do it. Go out and get started. I'm an open channel for a lot of people. The mm -hmm. software vendors and anybody who has the community's data diversity with their community is a way to be able to put your stuff out there. Um, that's really what it takes. And again, I, I think we just don't need to expect that it's going to be perfect right out of the gate. Yeah. Um, and be yourself. Don't try to be somebody else in what you're writing, right from your heart, right from what you've experienced. Because I think that when you go to the conferences and you listen to podcasts and you listen to webinars, that's what people want you to do. They want you to hear what they've experienced. And if you can learn from it, then that's a great thing. Well, write about what you're doing at work because I know I'm a channel. I know the software vendors and the, and the blogs and everything are channels or start your own. Mm -hmm. Again, never a bad idea to get that type of exposure um, and to show some level of progression as you've been doing this. It's the, it's the opportunity. Take advantage of the opportunity because it is there. Probably now more than ever is that opportunity there. Yeah, well, and, and I think that you're, you make a good point in that there's a lot of ways to get your stuff out there. Once you have the stuff, getting it out there is not that hard. There, you, you've offered an, an opportunity for people to to bring things to TDAN. That's a wonderful resource for the data management area yes, specifically. Write a, Anthony writes a, an article. Or I writes do. A, a quarterly column. I've written a it. quarterly column for for years, and and I mean, yeah. but even as something as simple as a as a LinkedIn post, as your own blog, you know, there's a lot of forums in, in which you can do that. But one thing that is especially worth knowing Noting, especially because a lot of people have this vision of wanting uh, to, to write a book someday. I can promise you no one has written a book or I hope nobody has written a book without having first published and, and road tested some of their ideas through blog posts or columns on TDAN or, or what have you. Certainly ideas that I had uh, from things that I'd written for TDAN or presented at Dataversity conferences um, you know, made its way into my book over time. And that's one thing like when you're a novice and, and when you're um, – an apprentice as, as, as you are in, in a lot of what you're learning and first entering into in the workforce. Uh, and I learned this lesson from, from my aunt who ran a, a very successful um, business in Boston in the um, civil engineering space. And she um, you know, had, had started in the space and uh, was learning and, and trying to get all the information she could from every, every direction possible. And one of her mentors uh, went to her and, and said one day, you know, you can't be an apprentice forever. You can't continue to just learn forever and expect to reach what you want to reach. At some point, you need to turn that direction around and start pushing things out instead of just pulling things in from a learning perspective. And that's what thought leaders do, is that we've said we've we've learned what we can find, and we now want to try to think through it and contribute back and push back out our ideas and test them in the market and see if it resonates with people, see if people find these useful and, and, and want to build on them themselves. That's how these things get, you know, exist so you can learn them. And so that's exactly what happens. You reach this point, and, and I would encourage you, the moment you start to think about trying to do it, you definitely should be doing it. I mean, like that to me is is the key is start doing it and learning from that because it will be a, a very rich experience for you um, just in terms of your own learning to put those ideas in front of others. 
You know what? I attended conferences for years before I started speaking. And I found that I got a heck of a lot more out of the conferences once I started speaking. And that wasn't that I was learning in my presentation, but when you talk about the things that you've done, you're now starting to engage other people who are in similar situations or who had a solution to what you did, or you can commiserate with them about how you're both dealing with these impossible issues within your organization. Yeah. I mean, I think that once I started speaking and people started coming up to me and saying, ah, I liked what you talked about, or you're just full of it. You know, you're, <laughs> you're, I didn't get that too often. I guess sometimes I still get that. Yeah. Um, and that, that's expected. I'd rather be challenged and have the opportunity to talk to somebody. And it is about ch- sharing. And I've shared this with my, my children, my, my young adults, not really children anymore, um, to do a lot of writing. I'm encouraging one of my children right now to do that. Um, and, uh, and the other one has been doing that already, not because of me, but because that's what she enjoys to do. Um, the other thing I was going to state too is that uh, when I came up with the name of the company uh, in KIK Consulting is Knowledge is King, the idea of transferring knowledge, I found that by transferring knowledge, not only did it make me feel better about what I was doing and sharing my experiences, but it made other people very willing to share back. Yeah. So it's both through the, the mentoring and the, the that I do a lot of the time with my clients. Um that in the conferences where I speak and get opportunity to, 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 you know, talk to people outside of my speaking, I've always said, I learn more from the conferences, not when I'm speaking. I mean, I'm giving, I'm trying to provide at that point mm-hmm. as the, just the interaction with people. I've made friends that have never spoken, never gotten up and spoken at, a, at an event that I know very well just yeah. by, you know, when we see each other at these, what feel like family events, right? Mm-hmm. Um, oh, what have you been doing recently? How's this problem that you were working on? It's all about give and take. And yeah, and, and again, I think now is the time for people to start to give back a little bit too. And I'm not talking about like donating. I'm talking about, well, that's not a, never a bad thing either, but but share with people what your experience has been because yeah. somebody may have, have experienced the same thing or taken a different course of action on that and we can all learn from it. so yeah i mean that's one of the reasons that we're even doing this podcast is that we just want to share like the data management community especially and and just kind of the broader business community and and community of leadership development you know oftentimes you can feel on an island and right now we all kind of feel like we're on an island because we're all working remotely and and trying to engage however we can um but to have that sense of community and to be able to just relate to one another and some of the the challenges and learn from each other and and get better ourselves like that is why we're doing this it's not about trying to sell work it's not about trying to sell books it's about trying to connect with people and figure out a better way to find a way to do this better ourselves and and help each other do it and and, and right now, that's really the, the important thing. I, I think you make a great point. And that's, you know, that's what we should be focused on right now is how can we help each other through this and get better and build for the future along the way? Because I, I, I want to go back too, to what you mentioned about your um, the statistics for TDAN, because TDAN has been around for a long time and you have a lot of, of you've built up a lot of readership over the years. But it's not surprising to me at all that when we first entered this very quickly, you know, this kind of lockdown setting, everybody was in like hold on mode. Everybody was just trying to like hang on. It was triage time. And for a couple of weeks there, nobody was thinking about any learning or or trying to figure things out or whatever. They were just trying to get through the day. Now things have stabilized to at least a point where we now see light at the end of the tunnel that tunnel might be long but we at least kind of have an idea of how we're going to get through this and what things might look once we get out of of this particular situation and now we can start to think again about how are we building those skills and the people finding the podcast or people finding your publication like they may not have budget right now to go buy stuff and buy trainings buy you know conferences but they can spend a little bit of time and they can learn and and think about things in new ways and and start working on okay how do i present this even just in my own internal team take some of these ideas that i've learned from different people and bring them to some of the people that may not have uh the interest or time to sit and listen to a data leadership podcast 
right? But they may be able to, to have a 15 minute meeting to learn a couple of things about what better to do in, in this remote working environment. And that's that's the kind of thing that we're trying to provide right now. So I think it's, you know, to me, it's, it's about saying, how can we continue to serve this community when everything's weird? And that's, I think, a, a reasonable well, thing and, to do. You know, people are, um, you're right. I think it took a little bit of time for people to get used to working remotely. And I think there are a lot of people that are still getting used to working remotely. Yeah. But think about the way it's always been, at least in the in the companies that I was employed by, that I was working for. They always ask you to put together or kind of draft a, a plan as to how you're going to better yourself over the next year. What are you going to do? Okay, I want to attend this conference. I want to write this article. Yeah. But I think that if, if people start to look at that, internalize that and say, okay, well, maybe the company's doing it for their good. I need to do something like that for my good, right? Mm -hmm. As, and maybe I say, okay, I want to uh, attend a webinar a month or I want to write a blog a month or a quarter or something like that. You don't have to get started by hitting it full force, jumping into it with both feet. See if you're comfortable in doing that. Yeah. But set a plan for yourself. I mean, I, I know I keep on a, a pad, I keep on a whiteboard that's next to my desk, you know, what I need to be doing and, you know, and it, it helps me to keep on track. Right. Um, I'm all, and innovate. And I mean, that's another word of the day, uh, along with opportunity is look for innovative ways to be able to do this. As you mentioned, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different channels out there that are looking for content to be able to provide. And, and the best way to do it is to make a plan. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have to be a detailed plan, you know, and just like your writing doesn't have to be perfect the first time, but have a plan and say, okay, I want to improve the way I write and here's a way that I'm going to do it. I want to improve the way I put together presentations because I know that data governance council meetings coming up at the end of May. And if I can get better at that, you know, they're going to be spending less time kind of looking at the slides like this and saying, oh, okay, I really get what it is you're trying to get across. So it's, you know, innovate and find things, but make a plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, that to me is, uh, is probably the best, uh, advice we can give is if you want to get involved in doing this, especially during these tough times, set up yourself to be successful moving forward. Make a plan. Check it off, mm -hmm. or or exit out once you've you've done something. Um, put it on into your Outlook calendar or whatever email or whatever calendar package that you use. Mm -hmm. Set reminders. Um, it's a good thing. It's gonna you, you will be happy that you did it. And once you get used to doing it, that's kind of the beauty of, I think it was with you as well, but with me personally, was once I got used to doing it, I, I, I couldn't see now operating without it. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And, and you know, it, it reminds me of one of my favorite books um, was this book uh, that I read called The, the Phoenix Project. And it's, it's really, it's a kind of IT uh, reimagining of a kind of popular operations pseudo fiction book uh, yeah, called The Goal. The name, of it again? Uh, the name of the book that I'm talking about is The Phoenix Project. And it's, it's fantastic, especially if you do anything uh, with IT operations, project development, anything in kind of a virtualized space. Um, it, it really helps you understand the parallels between good process in terms of IT versus, you know, things that have been well documented, well understood in, in manufacturing processes. So it, it draws some parallels. It's fascinating. It'll, it'll really teach you about the things going on around you and, and how common and interesting they are. But one lesson from it that I think is a, a particularly appropriate to the conversation that we're having is that you should always put an, an, a higher priority on improving the system versus iterating the system. And so it's basically like, if you can find a way to do it better, spend some time finding a way to do it better because it's not only gonna help you in each successive iteration of that particular process, but it's gonna give you a launching off point for future improvements. So it then allows you to get better and better and better. And that's where like, I think about just creating this podcast. I had originally planned on doing this like mid year or so to fit in with some of the other things. And then I, I made a bigger push because I wanted to get it out there while everybody was in lockdown because they could have access to something new. 
but the process of actually figuring out how to do it was pretty challenging. It spent a lot of hours and a lot of time up front and made some mistakes. And, and, and this is one of the reasons that I wanted to have you back on the show now is that you helped me navigate some of those early mistakes and figuring out how to record things well and, and make it all happen. And, um, you know, but now it's a much easier process to go through the content creation itself and actually produce the output. And because I had invested all this time in the process, now it's a lot easier. As soon as I have an opportunity to do a recording, I can get that recording done and in queue to, to be released much easier than if I were struggling through all the mechanics. And that I think is an important thing as well as, as we talk about planning is to start to learn by doing and improve your writing process, improve your daily operations process, find a way to have some structure to what you're trying to do because that structure is something that helps guide you through it when you run into blockers when you run into you know i don't know what to write about this quarter or whatever for for the column um but i want to take that and and switch gears a little bit into Boy, let me look, can I, if I could just comment real quickly so folks, absolutely when anthony tells you about a book you should go out and look at the book because he has some darn good books except for that book the little red hen that you <laughs> talked about during one of my webinars that i had you as a guest on um, I thought that you were going to say, I, I read this great book. It's called Caps for Sale. If any of you know what the book is, Caps for Sale. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a children's book. But um, mm -hmm. you know, even books that will help you to put your ducks in a row. So there's a very famous book called Who Stole My Cheese or mm -hmm. Who Moved yeah. My Cheese or something like that. And there's a parody of that book. And I have both of those. But this gets you to thinking, we're all in a position right now where somebody stole our cheese. You know, if our cheese is going into the office and doing work and, and interacting with people that way, our cheese is all done at this point. So we've got to find ways. And these are all there's just a ton of great books out there. But I'm going to look at the Phoenix Project and see, you know, if that makes sense for me to learn because you're constantly learning. I'm constantly learning. But tell uh, take it as good advice, folks. That's you know, <laughs> take out the book. I, I have I have no. Uh, vested interest in the book but it's probably going to be helpful to you. yeah I, I appreciate that it's it's been one where i've come back to and reread it multiple times and anytime i find myself drawn back to a book that's usually one worth recommending to others and and that Are is certainly drawn one. back to the little red head too or maybe that was just that <laughs> well for a period of time with my daughters i uh was going back to it every single night for months at a time it seemed so it was top of mind when i had that webinar and and the the thinking was is that you know you sometimes you need help to get things done and you know you, you need to ask for it but yeah I, I set it up as kind of this reference to this great business book and that i'm like the little red hen so it was memorable <laughs> if nothing else um so i want to I, I i while we still have a few minutes i i want to talk about how do you curate a online publication like what is the kind of thing if people are interested especially those data management professionals that are, are likely to listen to the show um you know what are you looking for in terms of content what kinds of ideas or, and kind of catalysts do you have for folks on that might be interested in writing but just don't know what to write about well you know it could be anything that you're working in you know it, when i was uh, worked for a blue cross blue shield plan as an employee years ago I was a metadata repository administrator. Maybe some of you are metadata repository administrators. Um, data modeling people write about their technique, um, write about how you get business people to listen to what you are saying and not just look at you, at you as being a technical person. I mean, first of all, people can go out to the T2N publication. I hope that they will and see the types of example, uh, types of things that are out there. There's uh, some people have referred to it as a blog site. It's, I think it's more than a blog site because a lot of the articles go into a little bit more depth and show a lot of examples and there, there's images and graphics and things like that that are very helpful. But first of all, be yourself. Mm -hmm. Use your own language. You know, use your, the words that you use to be successful in communicating with other people. But write about things that are meaningful to you, things that you're actively involved in. I'm guessing any of you that are watching this podcast at some point during the day today you got frustrated with something. Well, how did you deal with it? Or you had a technical issue that you had to overcome or um, a problem with a piece of software that you were using. You know what? There's other people out there that are doing the same things, maybe not the same ways, but doing some of the same things that you're doing. And, you know, write about that type of material. And it doesn't have to be tremendously long, especially these days. Um, 
I try to keep the size of the articles and the columns and the blogs and features on TDAN, uh, you know, a size that you can read it within one sitting. So don't think that you need to write a 2000 word essay or, you know, or a 5000 word essay when sometimes 750 words, a thousand words will will do. Just make sure that you can get your point across in that in that amount of space that you have. And um, again, just go out and, and start doing it. I mean, if you send me, if anybody would send me um, lists of subjects that they'd be interested in writing back, I'll be the first, I'll be glad to get back to them very quickly and say, you know what, I think my readers would, would really be interested in hearing how you, how you dealt with that issue. Um, I always say, put your, put myself or put yourself as you're writing in the, in the feet or in the shoes of the people that are reading it. Mm -hmm. Because then, you know, if it's not interesting to you, once you write it, it's probably not going to be as interesting to other people as well. But there are things every day, probably numerous of them. I don't know about you, Anthony, but what I do is when I get an idea, um, I write it down. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Risky Business, what maybe it was with uh, Henry Winkler and uh, Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton was the, uh, that was Night Shift, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, movie, yeah, yeah. Where he had a, a tape recorder and he was the idea guy. And whenever he had an idea, he'd pull out his tape recorder and he'd state, you know, hang bananas by their by their roots or whatever you know something that was a, what he thought was a great idea yeah. i'm constantly jotting down notes now the problem is i gotta find those notes wherever <laughs> I, I put them around but hey you know what that would make a good content a good piece of art, an article or a blog or mm -hmm. something and then propose it and you know i'll be the first to get back to you quickly and tell you i think that would be of interest to my readers yeah, well, one of the, I think back, and, and when I was just starting out writing, one of my favorite pieces, still remains one of my favorite pieces, was a, a piece I wrote for um, my the consulting firm I worked for at the time. It was called something like the, the Bad Piggy's Guide to Data Management. And so I took this cartoon and, and juxtaposed it with... with you know, data management it was this cartoon video game, and 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 I just drew some parallels and and made it an interesting lesson about how we do data management, some of the things we could do differently. But sometimes, like, take inspiration from those things, like the Little Red Hen or like the Bad Piggies Angry Birds game. You know, it's those kinds of things make it interesting for folks. It's a different perspective, and it's really insightful when you can look at something with a different cast of light. I think of, about everything as, as illuminating, right? And and we each have, each perspective is one, you know, beam of light. And through a bunch of different perspectives, we can fully illuminate any topic. And, and that's really what I think, you know, when you can find, hey, this perspective isn't well represented, or I haven't seen this, and I have an idea here, that's where uh, you might want to take it. Actually, that was the, how I figured out what I wanted to create when I wanted to write a book and, and say, okay, what is the unique thing that I could do here that hasn't been done already? Or what is the, what is the, the vantage point that I have from business and technology or what have you in the data space that I might be able to add something to the conversation. And, and that started with, you know, writing and speaking and, and building up this repertoire of ideas to the point where I finally said, you know what, let's put this into a book so people can get at it um, pretty easily compared to trying to track down all these random things that I've done over the years. And and that, well, you know, was, has been, you know, something that I'm proud of. Yeah. You haven't seen the movie August Rush? It's about a, a young ch a young kid who everything is music. Everything that he, that's going on around him, the garbage lids closing, the street cars going by, it's all like an orchestra. And he's got it going on in his mind, and he starts to to to, to um, orchestrate, you know, the sounds. And he ends up being a great composer at a young age. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly what you said. Take things out of what you're hearing. I heard somebody say something about battling their demons. And I said, you know what? Maybe people have data demons. I could write about <laughs> battling your data demons. And I wrote a column on it and put it on my publication. Um, I um, I was on a healthcare kick. I'm still on a health, uh, health uh, improvement kick. And I was wondering, well, why isn't my weight going down? And somebody mentioned to me, like a nutritionist said, that perhaps you're not eating enough. And your metabolism is going is going south, or it's not as fast as it should be, mm. or as up to where it should be to in order to lose weight. I ended up writing an article on well, maybe our data metabolism isn't as high as it should be. What can we do? What does that even mean? And you know what? It makes it very interesting. Some of those articles 
like the bad piggies in data, <laughs> um, you know, those types of things really um, resonate. And if you can get people to see themselves in what you're writing, you've won the game. I mean, that's really the idea. Yeah, well, and I think, you know, looking back on some of the things that you've written, Bob, you really are kind of the king of, of these unique ideas, like you, your repertoire of, of coming up with different takes on stuff. You've been doing this a long time, and, and you really do have some really interesting stuff out there and, and have been willing. And one of the things that I've always appreciated about uh, you in, in terms of, of what I learned from you is that you've never been afraid to take a stand. You 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 call it how you see it. And I think that's good advice for folks out there, too, is is don't be afraid to, to say what you feel and, and you know, recognize that there are implications to the things that you say sometimes, but it's also important to say, okay, I'm going to push on this issue. And maybe I'll even just admit, I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a little bit. And let's test this thing that we think is all true, that we all feel is, is the right way. And that's that's a good way of expanding uh, the conversation as well. You don't have to fully believe the idea to explore the idea. And, and that, I think, is an important key piece is that we, we're constantly inundated with people that are trying to write these persuasive pieces that it's refreshing when you see something written interestingly, but without a preconceived notion to say, I found this fascinating. Let's, let's explore it a little bit. That's what you did with your data metabolism story. And, and that's what we see a lot of in, in TDAN and in other areas when, you know, I find them worth reading is when that makes me think, not when it just makes me, yes, I agree. Or yes, I don't agree. You know, and a good example yeah. of that is, is again, coming back to kind of the pandemic and the situation that we're all in is I wasn't happy with the way the news was being reported. So my present, well, I don't know when this will go live, but my my article right now on the TDAN publication is called Truth in Data, Buyer mm -hmm. Beware, and how the people can use data to make you feel the way that they want you to feel rather than just giving you the facts. So I appreciate your saying that. I do, I write from my heart. And you know what? And there's something to be said about getting somebody to click on that article and so what you call it, and just to, in, in the introduction to grab and pull somebody in, I've, I keep learning that that's really, really important in getting people to read what you're writing. So I hope everybody will take the opportunity and build a plan and you know, come to me or come to Anthony and, and share with us what you're doing because I think there's a lot of channels and the world is really ripe for this stuff. Yeah, I mean, we, you and I personally are, are happy to help folks. And, and there's a lot of folks out there that, you know, want to help people that are getting started with this. We want more conversation. We want more people writing. We want more awareness because, you know, data is, is certainly not getting less important. And I think that's certainly true in our current situation, and it's been the trend for a long time. Uh, we're almost out of time, Bob. Do you have anything else that you want to say as, as some parting thoughts? And, and then we'll call it a show. No, I, uh, I really enjoyed doing this. I, I, um, I didn't, didn't realize I had so much information to share on that. But it's good just because in our conversation, we always touch on some very interesting subjects. So I look forward to hopefully the next time. And thanks for having me on. Absolutely, Bob. Thank you. And and we'll definitely have you back uh, on multiple episodes in the future. I, I'm, I'm hopeful of that for sure. Um, so, and thank you, Bob. Thank you for watching or listening today. You'll find links and more information about today's topic in the show notes. Please remember to subscribe to our show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Visit algman.com to learn more about Algman Data Leadership and the many ways we can help you become a data leader. Stay safe during these unusual times and go make an impact.